full disclosure, it's been six years since I've given a sermon, um, so uh, bear with me, give me some grace. I'm going to put the Lord to work today to try to do a little bit better job and clean up my mess of whatever I say, okay? Um, lastly, I am talking on campus on Wednesday through the business club um, about business ownership and stuff like that, if that's something that is boring to you or if I tank today, don't show up to that, okay? Okay. All right, we're going to be out of Philippians 4, verses 6 through 13, okay? Many of you will know the end of this passage. I'm sure almost all of you have been in the Word for a while. You will recognize this passage. I did not get slides ahead of time. Um, we got overlaid in Miami for two days. I procrastinated doing this, and then that bit me in the butt. So, um, But we're going to read from Philippians 4, verse 6, okay? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication... With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Skip down to verse 10 for me. It says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So this is the Apostle Paul, who comes with a bit of a resume when it comes to suffering, right? This is a man who was the highest of high, you know, the Pharisee of Pharisees, and was brought pretty low. He was shipwrecked, in jail, beaten, martyred, a lot of things. So he knows a little bit about suffering. He's got a little bit of a resume, but he talks in this passage about being content in all circumstances. And he talks about having a peace of God which surpasses all understanding. So this was the passage that came to my heart as I was thinking of what to talk to you guys today about. Um, the irony of me attempting to explain a passage in which the Bible says it's beyond our understanding is not lost to me. I understand that. Um, But I want us to focus on what is this peace that's beyond understanding that Paul's talking about? What does it mean to be content in all circumstances? I am probably 100% positive that every person in this room has gone through some version of turmoil, stress, suffering, something. I think the saying is, is we are all either on our way out of a storm or on our way right back into another storm, right? Right? There's always something either just behind us, right in front of us, or we are right in the middle of it, okay? So Jesus says, you take up your cross and you follow him. He never makes you the promise that life is going to be all smooth and easy and a cakewalk, right? But we are promised a peace through all of that. So I'm going to take us on a mini journey aside from that on how we can maybe attempt to find some of that peace. Again, It's beyond understanding, um, but I think there's some things that we can try to cover that can help with this um, as we go through some of our hard times. To do that, I'm going to take us on a little bit of a journey. I promise I'll get back to that passage, but um, I found it ironic. I picked up a book three months ago off of my shelf called uh, Body and Soul by J.P. Moreland. Um, And it is a pretty heavy book. It's a pretty thick book. J.P. Moreland uses high-end philosophy and theology to put out the existence of a soul. Um, The last time I read that book was on this island. I did not know I was doing this sermon before I picked up that book. It just found it to be a God-ironic thing. Um, But the book is fun, um, if you like that kind of stuff. Uh, But it takes you through the journey of the existence of your very own soul um, and has the discussion of the human soul. Funny enough... One of the things all of you are the most certain of is you are you. Think about it for a second. sounds weird, but it's true. And I can't put that into a test tube, right? Science can't prove that. However, you would argue with me till you are blue in your face that you are you. Anybody heard the Dr. Seuss quote about that? Right? I think it's, today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is more youer than you. Sounds weird, but it's true. However, if I were to ask you who you are, you would have a hard time defining that for me to some degree. Think of the old school, I just sat on a plane for a lot of hours to get here, right? You're sitting next to somebody, what do you, what do, you do? Where are you from? 
what do you do for a living, what's your name. However, if any of those things change, you're still you, right? A lot of you might be students here, okay? Well, when you're no longer a student and you get that DVM behind your name, are you still you? Yeah, you are, right? There were some fathers who stood up here, right? Before we were fathers, we were still us. Fathership could be a part of that, but you're still you. It's a weird, I know, Teddy, stick with me. I promise I'll get out of this. But, but the point is, is you are very certain of who you are without being able to tell me much of anything about who you truly are. Does that make sense? As sense as that could possibly make? Okay. So I want to get a little bit down this rabbit trail of defining ourselves or an identity of who we really truly are. Okay. And to do that, we're going to talk about what we aren't, or we're going to talk about what to not identify ourselves, okay? And that was the passage that was a part of the QR code, okay? But in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus tells us this passage, and I'm sure many of you heard it. We're going to just do it from a different spin. It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think a lot of us hear that passage and think, well, I'm not allowed to be rich, and if I'm not rich, and I'm poor, then I'm off the hook, and I'm good to go. <laughs> Done. Right? But that's not the true meaning of this passage. The true meaning of this passage means that there are a bunch of things on earth that we can toil after, identify ourselves in, wrap ourselves up into and if we're not doing it for the right reasons and the right heart and the right direction, then we're going to lay up our heart here on earth and not upstairs. Does that make any sense? I'll give you some simple examples. We're going to start off five different examples of this. Some of them are going to be pretty easy, and then the further down this rabbit trail we get, this is going to be kind of convicting. Okay? I want you to know when I wrote this sermon, I think I wrote it more for me than I did for you. So don't worry about it. I'm suffering this more than any of you. Okay? What about a car? Pretty easy to define. This is an earthly possession. It can be kind of status quo, though, right? I mean, so when we came to the island, we bought a 1998 Honda CRV. It had a navigation system in it. It didn't work, um, and we didn't need it, but it had a navigation system in it, right? Pretty, pretty hot stuff. It had AC that worked. I don't know if that's still a problem down here, but when we were down here, there was no, yeah, yeah, we had AC. Four seats. Five seats and a back area to put your, your uh, beach stuff in, right? We were classy in that 98 Honda CRV, right? Status, high status. It eventually rusted out. Surprise, surprise. Moth and rust destroy, right? We had to buy a different vehicle. I also bought a dirt bike when I was down here. I was so excited about that. It had a license plate taped on the back of it, okay? But it was legal, okay? And I was so excited about it because my wife didn't have to carpool me to school anymore. Um, it got stolen in two months, gone, overnight. Surprise, surprise, I know. I should have thought about it, but I wasn't willing to park it in my apartment, okay? So Jesus lays out here two ways we lose things, right? If we're talking doctor words, acute and chronic, right? It's either right here, right now, thieves will take this away from you, or moth and rust will take it away, okay? What about a house even, Right? I know, I know, you would never identify yourself with a house. I never would either, till I bought one 10 years ago. Told my wife we would not remodel any of it. We remodeled all of it. And now we're selling it. Now I'm kind of upset. You guys, I built the man cave of all man caves in this basement, okay? <laughs> it is 1,900 square feet. I got a, a black walnut bar top, a pool table, screens. It is gorgeous. It's going to be somebody else's next week. It's, I mean, it's easy to not identify yourself with something that you just bought, but I built that myself with my wife. It's kind of hard for that to not be a little bit of my identity, right? All right, Zach, I don't, I don't deal with that. I don't have a hard time with cars or houses. What about your appearance? Anybody look in the mirror today? No one? Yeah, right? Why'd you look in that mirror this morning? Did you look in that mirror so that you would look good for the Lord, who also saw how you woke up, by the way? Did you look in that mirror so that you would look good for your friends next to you, or your spouse, 
Did you look in that mirror because you love yourself? I'm not saying appearances aren't okay. I'm not saying that we can't go after ourselves. I'm a CrossFitter, right? I, I like to be in shape. Um, but why? Why do you toil after that appearance? How much is your appearance a part of your identity? Whether it's tomorrow, heaven forbid, something happens to you, or it's 30 years from now, your appearance will not be the same, I promise. Listen, this happened to me. I got into our vet clinic. Um, I was, it was my first year, and I was mixed animal in the beginning, and I happened to be buzzing around the small animal office, and I heard the technicians, um, young, pretty individuals in the break room, starting to talk about me. And I'd like to tell you that I wasn't so conceited that I walked away, but I didn't, unfortunately. And I stuck my ear close to the door, and I heard one mention how I might be attractive, and then the other responded with, Ew! <laughs> He's so old! I was 29 years old. I don't know when I hit you, but I did. I didn't get a letter in the mail. Sierra didn't roll over and say, I want you to know you're Ew now. Like, none of that happened. But somehow, moth and rust crept in and took a portion of my identity. You see, we all have, we're molded by him, right? And you can chip off pieces of this, but if I wrapped every portion of my pot around my appearance, it'd be pretty hard to find peace in that situation now, wouldn't it? Right? I'm not done, it gets tougher from here. I don't, I don't have a problem with appearances. I don't care about owning things. What about your career? Mm. There's a lot of vet students in here from what I hear still, right? Eight years of your life, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, all so that you can become a doctor. One day, whether that is because you fail an exam tomorrow or if that is because you retire, you will no longer be a doctor. It will go away. We as people, and especially in the Western culture, can obsess ourselves about a career. We will wrap our entire identity up into a career. Even the most noblest of careers, there are pastors in the world that have massive followings, 700,000 baptisms, and they don't have a family to go home to because they're obsessed with their career. You can take the most noble of things and toil after it and make it a treasure on earth and not a treasure in heaven. Does that make sense? Okay, it gets harder from here. So I did want to tell you the one story. I had um, one of my best friends um, that just retired said that to me and kind of gave me a glimpse of that. He was nervous about retiring, and I thought it was because he was hyper like me, and I was like, you're just worried about what you're going to do with yourself. And he was like, no, Zach, whenever you retire, you're no longer a doctor. And it was part of that kind of gave me some of that concepts of we are more, you are more than what you do for a living in life. Your identity is more than that. Now, these next two things are even harder, okay? And these, again, these get stickier and stickier, and it's not that we shouldn't be doing them, but it's how much we wrap ourselves up into the, them being all that we are. What about being a parent? Having children. It is definitely a godly thing. It is definitely a ministry that the Lord puts before you. I think I picked up, I could have picked up 7,000 passages for this, but Proverbs 17, 6 says, Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. Family is so important, but it cannot be all of you. It can't be your entire identity. I had an aunt once, aunt and uncle, and the moment, like the month after my cousin graduated, the last kid left the house. She had divorced her husband a month later. Her whole life was revolved around her children. Children are amazing. Trust me, I'm talking to myself, right? We have two amazing boys, right? I have one young man who's into sports now and it's all kinds of fun. We are doing football and we're doing wrestling. I'm getting a coach half of it. I watched him run for quarterback this year, throwing 20, 30 yard passes down the field. You have the, you should see the video of me hopping up and down the field like a schoolgirl. Like I love it, okay? 
I got another young man who, while we're on this trip, says he would like to be baptized. Yeah, there's, you can't feel anything better inside than, than that, right? But it's still not all of me. I'm still more than that. What about your spouse? 1 Timothy 3.5 says, For someone who does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? I say all the time that when you stand up before the Lord and before everybody and you say, this is the person that I will marry, that is the biggest ministry you will ever be handed to you your entire life. Make no mistake about it. It is your job to wake up every morning and show a glimpse of the face of God to that individual. However, that person is the Lord's and you are the Lord's. And your identity is more than just your marriage. There's a passage that it's kind of tough for us all to hear sometimes. In Luke 14, 26, it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Don't mistake this as Jesus saying to off family and not love anybody or care for anybody. But the old saying of God, family, work slash church is true, right? You have to put the Lord first. Okay, that's enough of convictions about treasures. Let's get back to peace, and a peace kind of beyond understanding. How do we achieve this? First and foremost, it says in the passage in the very beginning. It tells you right out of the gates. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. This is a peace beyond understanding because you don't own it. You can't give it. It is Jesus's. It is the Father's. So rule number one, pray for it. Ask for it. Rule number two should probably be pray for it and ask for it. Rule number three should probably be pray for it and ask for it. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Step number two, I want you to think about why you're doing the things you're doing and who you're doing it for when you're doing it. We can often get wrapped up in the hustle and the bustle of the life, the busy, the this and the that. And we forget why we even started on this journey and where we're headed. Right? Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for someone else? Or are you doing it for the Lord? You can take a single action and the heart behind it totally changes. You could buy a bouquet of flowers and hand it to Sierra right now. I could hand it to her for selfish reasons, right? I could hand it to her just because I'm obsessed with her beautiful smile. Or I could hand it to her because God told me, show her love. Same action. Different heart, different meaning. One treasures up here, one treasures down here, Right? Now, the encouraging part of this that I want you to know is I asked you what your identity was. The Apostle Paul says we are all either slaves to righteousness or slaves to sin. It's in Romans, right? There's, there's no middle grounds. You're either a slave for the Father or you are a slave for the devil. And... Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.10, You are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Colossians 3.23-24, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I don't know most of you. From what I led with, I feel like most of you might have a hard time telling me who you are. However, I'll tell you, you are all children of God. He loves you. He cherishes you. He created you to do his work. And you're going to run into bumps along the way. And it is going to be so much easier and peaceful to handle those bumps. 
if you know who your best friend is, if you know why you were created and where you're coming from, you're his. Nothing can get in the way of that. No one will stop it. Not even angels. Nothing. Okay, that might be a little short. That's what I have. Okay? Let me leave us in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this beautiful congregation. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, to be with them, um, to love them, just to see their faces, Lord. Lord, they are all, they're your children, Lord. We are your children. Lord, we know that you created us in your image and you created us to do your works, Lord, and we ask that you give us the hearts and the tongues and the hands to do so and that we can work and toil towards you, that we can honor you and glorify you everywhere we go and everything that we do. And as we run into those bumps and those roads and those hiccups and those heartaches, Lord, we ask that you give us your spirit and give us that peace, that lasting peace, that we know that you got it and you're in charge and that our identity is wrapped up in you and in no one else. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.